I'm happy up here in our branded shirt or anything. Uh, all right, let me, let's just get started here. Quick little prayer here before we get to Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to invite you in here tonight, Lord. We have a few faith, faithfuls here tonight that just want to come and worship you and learn about you, Lord. And just ask that you would lead us and guide us and let me kind of hide behind you with, and let this sermon be what you would have me to say and not my words. Father, we just ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Years ago, my brother and I were tearing down a fence that didn't work with our plans for the farm. We were fairly new to the farming business and had many lessons to learn yet about how things should be done. I was pulling staples from the fence post. Ideally, I should have been using a fencing tool. Something that kind of looks like this. I didn't figure a lot of these ladies might know what that was. But of course, we didn't know what it was at the time either. So we used whatever we had, you know. Hammer and a screwdriver. Pry them out. And then after we, while well, we figured out that a punch might work a little bit better, so we used a hammer and a punch. If you ladies that don't know what a punch is, it's basically a, a pointed chisel. It's a little flat on the end instead of a point, but... Um, but the constant pulling and pounding on the screwdriver pretty much destroyed the screwdriver. You know, we bent the shaft and broke the handle. And using the punch, darn near cost me an eye. <laughs> I took a hammer and I hit that thing once and it just ricocheted back and I mean, it hit me right in the glasses. Put a big, took a big chunk out of my polycarbonate lens. So, thank goodness I was wearing glasses at the time. So. Has anybody here ever tried to make or build something with the wrong tools on the wrong ingredients, materials? I mean, you can't use a screwdriver for a saw. And you can't substitute salt for flour, you know. We've all tried one time or another to make do with what we have. But invariably, we end up with less than desirable results. Still, everything we make, we do it for a purpose. You don't build a big bookshelf with the intentions of throwing it in the trash heap. Or you don't bake a cake with the planning on feeding it to the garbage disposal, do you? And God didn't make us for no good reason either. We all have a purpose in God's plan. Let me show you what I mean. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians. We're going to go to chapter 2. We read in verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> and I'm going to be in the New American Standard tonight. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we, too, all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of their flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surprising riches of his grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Yeah, a little bit of background. Some scholars have dated, have doubts that his Ephesians was written by Paul, even though he identifies himself as the writer in the very first verse. I'm just going to go with tradition and the vast majority and assume that this was Paul speaking to the Ephesians church. Again, 
There are theories that this was written to another church or that it could have been a circular letter meant to be passed around from church to church. But the truth of what is said is of far greater importance than the particulars of who and where. This is one of the prison epistles written by Paul while he was in prison, probably in Rome. Paul was obviously writing to believers as he states that you he made alive. We have all heard stories of people who died on the operating table and then they were revived. Of course, we're talking about a physical death there. The Ephesians were spiritually dead in trespasses and sins following the course of this world. They were given to fulfilling the desires of their flesh. And flesh here meaning the fallen human nature incapable of conforming to Christ holy expectations or God's holy expectations <clears throat> and the desires of their minds. And all this was orchestrated, of course, by the prince of the power of the air, whom we know more commonly as Satan or the devil. Yet even while they were in that state, God loved them so much that he made them alive. Even though they were incapable of conforming to his expectations, God loved them. And he made them alive together with Jesus, whom he also raised from the dead. They were dead, but now they're saved. They're saved by grace. Paul repeats that twice in this short little passage. Grace would be undeserved acceptance or a love received from another or undeserved favor of God in providing salvation for those deserving condemnation. God's great mercy, and mercy, I looked up, just to put it in here, is, could be translated as pity or leniency. Because of his mercy, he does that for them. But there is a catch. Though they were saved by grace, it was through faith. Faith would be belief and trust in God, confidence that he will do it. They had believed that God would save them, well, they had to believe, excuse me. They had to trust that God would save them, and they had to have confidence that God would save them. Paul then points out that salvation is a gift. It's a gift from God. There's nothing that any of them could have done to earn it. God just gives it to them out of his great love for them. There's no reason for any of them to boast. All that was necessary was for them to believe and receive. They were made by God with a purpose for good works. And he already has a list made for them to do. I bet Mike's got a honeydew list at home on the refrigerator. God's got a list for us too. When I was a kid, I believe it was Flip Wilson who popularized the saying, the devil made me do it. And we laughed. When I got to high school, we used to say, I was born that way. What's your excuse? And again, we laughed. I once heard Rush Limbaugh say, there has to be some truth in what we're saying for it to be humorous. And he was right. I'm sure that everyone here has done some things they knew they shouldn't have, whether in thought or deed, you know. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All is pretty inclusive language. Don't you think? Guilty. Just like the Ephesians, we were all born with a sinful nature. And while I'm not sure that the devil can actually make you do something, he sure can put a powerful suggestion in your mind that's pretty irresistible. And I'll guarantee you, that no matter how good Satan makes it sound, nothing but bad will come from it. Yet, even in our fallen nature, indulging in the lust of the flesh and mind, God loves us too. He offers us mercy and grace just as he did the Ephesians. And just like the Ephesians, he offers us salvation and eternal life as a gift. 
we can earn it. Has anybody here ever asked Santa Claus what he had, what they had to do to t to keep that bicycle he brought him? You know, for Christmas. We always say Santa brought me a bike, not I had to do dishes and take out the trash for a year for my bicycle. Just believe it and receive it. Remember when I said you were made for a purpose? This screwdriver was made for a purpose too. Now obviously, it's been used for a purpose for which it was not intended. Now it's pretty broken. You might even say it's useless. You know. Perhaps Satan's used you for a purpose that you were not intended to be used for. Maybe you're feeling broken. Maybe you feel useless. Broken tools end up in the trash. You know, tossed away. Even those with a lifetime guarantee, you know, have exceptions for misuse. But you're not a tool. You're not beyond repair. You can return to your manufacturer and be remade for the purpose that you were created for. Second Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Fencing pliers are a specialized tool. It's got a curved hook here on the back for hooking in underneath that staple. You can take your hammer and drive it in if you need to, pull it out. Sometimes I don't get it all the way and you can hook onto it and still pry the thing out of there, that way you don't lose the staples. That's a pretty good job. I probably pulled thousands of staples with that thing. Yet, other than some dirt on it, you can hardly tell it's been used. It's because it was used for the purpose for which it was intended. If I ever need to pull a bunch of staples again, that's what I'm going for. I'll grab that right away. Yeah, you bet I want it. Screwdriver was used incorrectly. Bent, broken, all chiseled up there. Pretty much useless for the task for which it was designed. A guy don't want you to end up like this one. He wants to make you useful. He wants you to fulfill your purpose. Are you ready to be made alive? Do you want to be part of God's kingdom? We're here to build his kingdom and any building project needs to have the right tools. You have a place in this project. You're exactly what God is looking for. He made you with a purpose. He's already got a list of things for you to do. He wants you. Confess your sins, change your ways, fulfill your purpose in God's plan. There's a lot of people who can name for you the day and date they knelt at an altar. They can point to the very spot. For me, it was at the old Akron District Campgrounds. I'm not even sure they're even there anymore. I'm not good with dates. I can't tell you the day. I can't tell you the message that was preached. But I can tell you that I knew that Jesus loved me and that I wanted what he had for me. If I could find that altar, like I said, it's probably gone now. I could show you the spot where I knelt. I mean, if it was in this room, it would be right in the middle of that pew there. That was 45 or 50 years ago. Yep, it was a memorable experience. Yep, it's a significant time in my life. 
it was shortly after that I felt like God wanted me to be a preacher. <laughs> As you know, I put it off a long time. But God's patient. If He's been patiently calling you, don't put it off. Pastor Rick Harvey has a big church out west somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. But I got a quote from him out of some of our stuff we had to do in this class. He says, I have never said yes to God and regretted it. And you won't either. So when I was preparing this, I kind of just sort of felt like God wanted me to have everybody who was able, if you would, just kind of come down to the altar to sort of have a group prayer tonight. So if you don't mind, we'll just finish up with a quick prayer here. If you're not able, that's okay too. You know, we got altars, we get the front rows. Since we've got such a small little group tonight, we'll just sort of make this a... Front pew's fine. I'm a little one sided at night. <laughs> Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just love you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do and for all that you're going to do. And Lord, we know that each and every one of us here has a purpose. We know that you love each and every one of us here. And Lord, we know that you have a gift for us. And that gift will take us places that we can only dream of. And Father, I just want you to be with everyone here tonight. If you just examine every heart, show them how much you actually do love them, Father. And Lord, we know that there's this big project that you have for us all. And this church is part of that project. And Lord, we want to fulfill that purpose. And we want to make sure that all the tools are available. So Lord, if there's someone here that needs a little sharpening up, or maybe someone that needs to be remade completely, Lord, we just ask that you would step in and do that right now, Father. And Lord, we're not going to tarry for a long time. We're just going to finish this up real quick here. But Lord, we just love you, we praise you, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, amen.